A Tiny Revolution features adults having adult conversations, which means adult language is probably going to be present, just so you know. Hey, I've got a question for you. Do you like this podcast or maybe the videos or the blogs that I've been creating over the past couple years? Well, here's the thing. I'm an independent creative, which means that I don't have that blue apron money. You don't hear advertisements from, you know, a psychology website or anything like beyond plugging my friends and their work. Um, And I also don't have the assistance of a production team. I do all of this on my own. And creating things like podcasts and, and videos and blogs, it takes time and energy and not to mention money. Um, a lot of this is on my own dime. So uh, if you want to support this podcast, if you think it's been good for you or the people around you, I'd really love for you to become a sustaining partner through Patreon. Even if something as little as $1 a month is a great way to help in creating content that speaks to the queer and progressive Christian experience. To find out more, you can go to patreon.com slash the Kevin Garcia and check out the perks of being a supporter, which I'll also talk about later in the podcast. But for now, thanks so much for listening. And uh, yeah, let's jump into the show. Hello friends, welcome to A Tiny Revolution, a podcast featuring conversations with ordinary people leading revolutionary lives. My name is Kevin Garcia and welcome to episode 40. Something you might notice here on the podcast is that uh, moving forward, I'm kind of moving towards more complete interviews, a little bit less produced without the breaks in conversations, moving kind of like towards actual conversations. Something I noticed in my own creativity is that I wanted to get these conversations out faster But the thing holding me back was that I felt I needed the, I felt like they needed to be a certain caliber. They needed to be a little bit more professional and they are professional as professional as they can be when you're on a shoestring budget to borrow a line from my friend, Matthias Roberts, who is also on a podcast that he produces himself called Queerology and you should definitely go listen to that. Um, But it's uh, it's hard sometimes to produce something at the level that you wish you could when you don't have a large budget. So for now, I'm pretty content to kind of let go of this need for perfection. And instead of trying to be perfect, I'm going to just try to be good. And that's something you can always expect from me on this podcast is something really good. It's been a really dope journey as a creative these past few years. And um, yeah, that's one thing I'm growing in. I'm very, very happy with where this whole thing is leading. And I'm, I'm now able to approach the podcast with joy again instead of feeling like, like I'm dreading it. Um, so yeah, um, it doesn't have to be perfect, y'all. It just has to be good and true and honest. And that's what today's conversation is going to be. But before I jump into that, I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to be leading worship again this year at the GCN conference in Denver. And I'm also going to be leading a workshop. So get super pumped, get super excited and hurry up and get registered. I think this is going to be a pivotal year for GCN and I'm excited to be there with you and all the wonderful people. You can get all the information at GCNConf, that's G-C-N-C-O-N-F dot com. Now on to today's conversation. I met Satchel Drakes, uh, well, technically I've never met Satchel Drakes, but we did connect on Twitter and I don't really remember how or why, but like, I think we were bonding over like nerdy things, um, and like being queer Christians and you know, stuff like that. I knew that he had some stuff on YouTube and so I I DM'd him a few times to ask about, uh, stuff on how to start a YouTube channel and he was really supportive the whole time and he gave me some pointers and then one day I was looking at his Instagram story and he's at this convention and is the most popular kid in school and I was like what who is this guy and it was so I texted him I'm just like what do you actually do are you like low-key an internet celeb and he's like well in the sense that this helps pay my bills yes and I was like hell yeah dude and so suddenly I felt like I was friends with like the coolest kid in school and that's how me and Satchel Drake's really cemented our friendship. And he's also been such a supporter of my work over these past couple years, so it's been cool. So after like a year of tweeting and like talking on Instagram, we finally had a real life conversation on Skype and he is just as delightful as he is all over the internet. 
So Satchel Drakes, just you know a little bit about him. And yes, Satchel is his real name. Um, he's a content creator, and he focuses on intersections of gaming and art and our real lives. He's the co-host. No, he's just the host of the Forbes Overworld podcast. And on top of that, he is a queer person of faith. In this conversation, we talk about his background, what led him to the world he now resides in. Uh, it honestly kind of surprised me. And we even have a little bit of a shout out about our mutual friend, Matthew Vines. So go ahead and dig into this conversation with me. Grab a glass of whatever you prefer. And yeah, this is my conversation with my internet cousin, Satchel Drakes. So my name is Satchel Drakes. Um, I primarily, um, I guess I'm known for making YouTube videos um, just internet content in general, um, but YouTube, the primary platform, uh, typically about games and music, um, games at the intersection of art and culture and uh, music, usually in the form of like mixtapes, kind of stuff that I'm listening to that I enjoy. Um, I am uh, one half of the Forbes gaming team. Uh, there's a podcast called Overworld, and we kind of do the same thing where We'll talk about um, the kind of interesting things that we feel uh, games lately have been doing, uh, whether it has to do with exploring a new way to experience comedy, um, dealing with social issues like immigration or, um, or queerness. Um, and outside of that, I, I goon a lot on Twitter and <laughs> say ridiculous things that are not follow-worthy in any capacity – um disagree and yeah and then and then go to a bunch of conventions and like nerd out and be absolutely silly yeah <laughs> that's my whole thing i love i love creative i love creating anything and everything and meeting other people who create things and have interesting things to say about um what we're doing while we're kind of on this pale blue dot it's it's all fairly fascinating to me so how did you how did you get into the whole content creation around games and art and how did you end up finding yourself there was it uh, a path you always knew you were on or is it something you stumbled into mm, definitely stumbled into it um i was years ago maybe like five or six years ago i want to say off the top of my head i i've always kind of had a love for games i kind of grew up in that generation where it's like you know games are mine they're my thing um and they were kind of like on this weird cusp of like social acceptance where um, you know, if you, if you play, like you could just play it and kind of do your thing. You know what I mean? When I was in college, I, I think just about every dude bro was playing call of duty on their Xbox 360, oh, yeah, but for sure. Um, and if, but you, if you were in you like doing? the deep, exactly. Yeah. And if you are like halo and like, if you were, but if you were like in like some of the deep cuts, you know what I mean? Like that's where at a dinner party, the conversation might go, okay, like let's move on from that. You know, <laughs> um, I, I was actually never really a part of like a community of people who enjoyed games. I was usually kind of like just kind of did my own thing. My sister and I are like eight years apart. So I kind of like always knew how to, sorry. <laughs> You're totally fine. Always knew how to, uh, yeah, always knew how to uh, entertain myself. Um, but I felt this need to like kind of like stick up for games in a kind of way because of that. Like, cause I would just kind of freely enjoy what I enjoyed. Um, but I remember at the time, like, I mean, I was kind of almost exclusively surrounded by like a church community. My church community was like, Oh, you're so weird. Like, what do you like? What, what do these get? Well, why do you love these games so much? You know I mean? Yeah. And I was like, Oh, you guys just don't understand. You know what I mean? Like there's something cool about it. Um, at the time, what, what sort of thrusted me all into this, like just to give it a snapshot, like, I was a I was a pastor as a church planner in Philadelphia. What? And um yes. <laughs> oh my god. I was goodness. with the uh yeah, I was with the PCA. Okay. Um the church that I was planning uh I think I'm well I'm not like beholden to anybody anymore. We were planning it with a uh, guy named Bill Crispin. He's uh at the time he was on the board for Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia and he um teamed up with Tim Keller to plant Redeemer in New York City. And the goal was to kind of do like, to kind of like have the Redeemer of Philadelphia, essentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I was kind of a part of that team. I was with the Neo-Calvinists. Um, I was slated to go to the seminary program with John Piper, Mark Driscoll, this whole thing. 
And <laughs> it's funny. It's, it's actually funny hearing reactions now when I talk about it because um, it was a different reaction years ago, as you can imagine, right? Yeah. And um, all of that kind of fell apart. I guess, you know, in a, in a weird, really small way, I started asking questions that I was seldom receiving sufficient answers for about what we were doing with our time mm-hmm. and what we were doing – with the people that decided to stick around and listen to the things that we had to say. And, um, long story short, I was kind of in a process and un- unpacking personal stuff as well. I was like in a process of kind of getting out of that. And I was like, sort of like in the wake of like leaving that context, I ended up moving back up to the New York city area. Um, there was some family stuff that was kind of calling me out there and it, it was just sort of like an ad propos, um, reason to start moving like out of that and like away from that. And it was kind of something it's like, Oh, these circumstances are pulling me out. But you know what? I think I really do. I think I really do need to like question everything that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, I was kind of in a, a bit of a deserters, uh, deserters fatigue kind of Mm -hmm. season when I moved back up, just sort of floating, really interested in different art things. Got, got super involved in film, wanted to go to NYU Tisch and like study videography. And, I decided, well, I mean, I want to do video stuff. I want to talk about how art impacts people. I want to talk about purpose. Like in my head at the time, video games made perfect sense Um, because around the time I left was around the time that Braid, this independent game, the most critically acclaimed independent game ever came out. Mm -hmm. And it was this – the reason it, the reason it was so popular was because it was the first time there was sort of like an online marketplace on consoles. So it was really accessible in the living room for people to get independent games, and it talked about something really deep, really interesting about life and love and romance and and being a human. And I thought, oh, like maybe I'll just like start. I'll go on the internet and I'll try to find other people who are kind of like me, and I'm just gonna like start making videos talking about what I really enjoy about what games are doing. Cause in my head, video games are one of the most powerful mediums of conveyance that we have. When you think about it, art in its most reductive form, it is just a ref- it is just a mirror or a window to a story, right? Yeah. You're either sharing something that is yours or you are revealing something to somebody else, uh, whether it's through fiction or whatever. And in my head, um, video games are the combination of sound design music, um, um, visual arts, uh, narrative, all inside this wrapper of interactivity, which introduces this layer of player agency where you're now involved in whatever the person's trying to convey. And I feel like that, um, that is an incredibly powerful way to tell a story because now I'm getting my hands dirty with you. Um, and any perspective I bring to the table it sort of matters in a kind of way and you can you can get very personal with somebody so i wanted to talk about the technology behind that and i guess over time like um i just i don't know i I started making other friends who were kind of doing the same thing and it caught the attention of people that i didn't think that it really would and i don't know i kept doing it and having different conversations with others and kind of found myself in like a community and kind of in a rhythm of just uh, call and response with making stuff and getting feedback. And it's been largely like a humbling experience because I've gotten a lot of feedback as somebody who makes things on the internet. I'm sure, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> I've definitely, and it's, 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 I, I mean, not to be cheesy, but it's iron sharpens iron in a kind of way in, in a yeah, very, for sure. in a very huge way. So, yeah. Cause I think sometimes like you put your iron out there and then everyone's like, I have something to say. This is what you're doing wrong. This is what you need to do better. This you can, what about this? What about this? And it's like, I'm being cut up on all sides right now, Barbara. <laughs> yes. It's, um, yeah. Being, yes. being an internet human is, uh, can be very taxing because I think what's interesting too, um, and maybe you, I don't know if it's different for you or in your experience because of the, the field that you kind of work in. Um, but when it comes to things like, uh, I don't know, and maybe you do experience it similarly, but like relationally, there's a lot of energy that gets put out there because you, uh, in some ways you're, you're tying yourself to a whole group of people. You may not know them. You may not be in their physical space, but you're still involved with their life somehow. And Mm. so as such, it's like, um, almost you feel a responsibility 
to this group of people, to like a, a tribe that, you know, for better or for worse, is kind of following you in some ways. Um, I don't mm. know. I did want to jump back real quick to, um, because I'm always interested in, in points of faith, which is kind of like where I live, as you know. Fair, um, yeah. But so you were in the PCA world, you were working towards possibly seminary, and you were, uh, and you can share as little or as much as you want. This is not me asking you to give a tell all, but I'm just curious. Sure. Like, what, like, what were the questions that you were beginning to ask um, that weren't getting answers? Um, so I was, I was actually in seminary at the time. Um, I had to leave that. Um, I was in a, I was in a different, um, I was in a different seminary, just like local to the area. And I mean, you know, I think a lot of the questions that I had were just around, they were around leadership. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were around transparency and they were around, are we I think the big central question is, are we being as precious about the time that we are spending with each other that we seem to be communicating in almost a, uh, um, in almost, almost like as if it, it, it it's mantra, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for me taking up the role of a pastor, at least pursuing it, it kind of opened up this door to, um, a world of understanding that I got very, very far away from what I was expecting. And in some ways that was really good. In other ways, um, it led me yearning for something that I knew wouldn't be satisfied. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is um, hanging out with other – like you figure things like pastor's retreats or like meetings where it would be just pastors. Um, when I was kind of in that context, um, in some ways it was the most um, – it was the most amazing time that I would have. And now looking back on it, it was actually probably that slash problematic. But in the mm -hmm. moment, yeah. what was in the moment, what was really exciting was, you know, like, oh, we're all going to sit around. We're going to light a cigar and we're going to talk about the shit going on. <laughs> Sorry, can we curse on this? Can oh, we absolutely. We okay. can curse on this. But just like, know, I'm, like, pi I'm picturing so uh, – so many white dudes and a cigar <laughs> and like, we're going to drink whiskey and craft beer because C.S. Exactly. Lewis did it. So yeah, that's exactly what it was. It was, that was always sort of like the permission. So you had a cigar, you had like a McAllen 13, McAllen 12, whatever. Oh, and like, or you're drinking bourbon, you know, and, and like, it was this whole thing of like this kind of waxing poetic. I mean, now that I kind of look at it, like you can't see me right now. I'm like flexing my arms, but it was like very much like that. Like it was like a, like, I'm a man, I'm a pastor. Like, yeah, look at these people I have to manage this administrative, blah, 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 blah whatever. Um, but like in the time, like people were very vulnerable with one another. Um, people were, they were very honest about the realistic, unrealistic things going on about um, their inability to help people about. Um, theological things that like we would present as like conclusive or that have a resolve, but really don't, there was room for um, things to not necessarily resolve. There was room for uh, things to kind of be in this never ending debate or to sort of admit that like somebody outside of the camp, uh, you know, like they might have a, they might have a better understanding. You know what I mean? There was, and there was this room for this gray and that gray, I like latched onto it because it was exactly what I needed at the point in my life. Mm, yeah. Um, I needed it because I needed to be okay with it. And I didn't know how to be that way because we're not taught to be that way. Right. You know, um, we're taught our, our security is sort of in this like solid rock of what we're told. And, and, it was amazing to find that gradient for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm over it, but like there's sort of like, <laughs> but at that first time, you know, I'm not over it, of course, but you know what I mean? Like in the time there's an excitement and um, he here's what I realized. And it, it took me a long time to formulate ex the exact frustration that I sort of, that I sort of had. Um, so I'm a designer mm -hmm. and I work in tech and uh, there are two designers that I've definitely at multiple points in my life looked up to. That's Jonathan Blow and that's Matias Duarte. Uh, so you're talking about like design guy, Apple design guy, Google, right? Mm -hmm. They have amazing, you know, these guys have amazing ideas. You know that they're untouchable. You know that like they are constantly thinking about what works and what works for the entire world. And they kind of have to, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. it's this unavoidable thing. Like there is no doubt in my mind that they have incredibly nuanced and 
and detailed and gray thoughts about how to work with other people and how to design something that is compelling. Um, yet, if you ever – like Google – like I love when I find somebody I love. I love to YouTube like interviews of them. You know what I mean? And like mm-hmm. just find out how their mind works, how the gears turn. You ever look up an interview of any of those guys – um, they'll always say, well, here at Apple, we really believe in innovating the user's experience. And so we're trying our best to, and you get this very non answer answer. You get this very low fidelity answer. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, I know exactly what that is because I deal with it and you deal with it as people who make things on the internet where, for example, and this has happened in the past, I say something wrong or somebody says something wrong and somebody catches it and then someone puts it on Reddit and then you get this weird snowball effect where it turns into this huge shitstorm over the thing that you said because there wasn't proper context for it and all of a sudden your the world is spitting back to you something that you might have said and that's not exactly what you meant and or and you're frustrated about it maybe not necessarily even because like you feel like some reputation is tarnished because who cares about those but because you were hoping that your thought that you believe in would land in a particular way and it did not. Hmm. And um, as a result, what you get from people who are aware of the possibility of the shit tor- shitstorm and want to avoid it are people who give – they give media trained answers to questions. Yeah. And, and you know who ends up losing in the end? I mean the person who ends up losing in the end – is ultimately the, the the viewer. It's the listener. It's the person who, or just the person who is seeking out, like seeking to widen their worldview, seeking to learn more. You know what I mean? Right. They end up losing by that media trained answer. And I guess Ooh, I started feeling like this, I was oh, sorry. This just no. like resonated on a deep level right now. Okay, cool. So I started feeling that way in church, where the best answer is always the media trained answer, and we've created this industry around exclusively media trained answers in a way that we don't even think to ask follow up questions and it's almost rewarded to have the faith to not ask follow up questions Ugh. that gets this social reward that is incredibly discouraging for somebody like me who does want to ask questions and learn more and do want to spend time i'm sure other people do as well but they're not aware of it, it like it takes it takes time and it takes feeling incredibly uncomfortable to the, get to the place where you're like, no, I need to know this. Mm-hmm. And um, as a pastor, I felt like um, – or depending on where you are, like pastor would be whatever in training, whatever. Like um, I felt like a liar out the gate and I felt like I was participating in – it's extreme to say a masquerade of sorts, but actually a masquerade of sorts. At yeah. the time, I probably had different words for it. Like I didn't want to like throw anybody under, under the bus. I'm a little bit more liberal about that now because I kind of I kind of see it a little bit more for what it is. But oh, like yeah. when you have distance but, from it, it's always just like, oh, that's what that giant ivory tower was. Exactly. You know what I mean? Uh, no, that's exactly what it is. And it was sort of like here are these guys were all coming together and – We're lifting the veil amongst one another because we're safe, but these are people's lives and these are people's situations and what we're discussing is the truth and very different from a consumer electronics company that's trying to sell a new phone next year. We shouldn't have a product that's getting in the way of us walking more honestly together. And so in in that Mm. regard – there isn't a blocker within the context of church where if somebody asks us a question after our sermon and we don't know, we just say we don't know. Or like we say, well, I was looking through these two textbooks and like this right here or whatever. We're, we don't do that. Like, no, we're not, we're not right away like trained to do that. Like right away we're sort of trained like, oh my gosh, but can we keep people – Within the Westminster Shorter Catechism of Understanding, or I mean, I'm speaking mm. for PCA stuff, like, yeah, and and there's this whole sheep management thing, as if we're not sheep too. I, I, I don't know. It, so no, it just gets it, sticky. Yeah, it makes total <laughs> sense because, like, I experience, I have been experiencing this firsthand, uh, and like, in it happened. It doesn't just happen in like PCA world, or like, I think it happens across the board in so many different denominations, especially in hipster like pseudo progressive evangelical land. No, I'm totally with you. Um I um 
So I was looking around at churches to go to. I found one to go to, but I went to the website and I was like, y'all look too good for there not to be something going on here. Yeah. So I like, I just, I just have this sense. I don't know. I just look at the web design. Like, I don't know. Being a designer is just like, and you and like it's this whole thing. smell a phony behind their good design. I smell it because they're, they're pushing progressive real hard. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I started sending emails about where they land on the inclusive spectrum. And I got the same thing, which is sort of like, well, we believe that every person is created and all this other. Just very, very much like sort of like the, the kind of generalist equality, but mm-hmm. with scripture in particular, kind of dodging that theological stuff. And even if I clarify like, hey, like I'm – I'm read in this. Just give it to me straight. Like I couldn't necessarily get that because you imagine it's it's like a secretary at a desk that's kind of speaking mm-hmm. on behalf of the umbrella of C3 churches. And uh, and the moment I found out they're like a little bit in bed with Hillsong, I was like, OK, I'm getting what I'm going to get out of this. But it um, I I went on their website and I saw that they had a video of a guy kind of doing the, the testimony rigmarole of like, yeah, so like I have SSA. Uh, and I have it. I, I have know. it. <laughs> I know, I know, girl, I know. And he's like, I have SSA and, you know, and, and then like the whole narrative of like, and I got into the club scene and I got into the sex party scene. I got into the leather bar scene and, and like, I, and I, I contracted I... HIV and this church helped me out of all these other things. And it's just like, there isn't a, nat- you, you need to stop doing that thing where you don't acknowledge that there is not a natural line between me liking the D and this situation that you're in like yes the, the, like there's socially there's a socialized path from one to the other but that is not point a to point b mm-hmm. and c3 helped you out of your drug addiction and it helped you out of the sex life scene that you didn't want to be a part of and it helped you out of these addictions right and it gave you the support that you needed dealing with being positive of course that's a sensitive important issue you know what mm-hmm. i mean um but that is still separate from that is still separate from you liking guys that is still that is still separate from you being from you having a romantic capacity towards mm-hmm. men and not women mm-hmm. and i don't know well you can cut around that if you'd like to but like that was like a whole thing yeah, yeah. It, like it, it was just a th- that came to mind right away when you said that it's, no but like that that's the thing too it's, it's exactly that is like there's so many churches who like if like if say for example i was somebody who was uh, uh a side b individual where um where i would say you know, I I have SSA. I have same sex <laughs> attraction. Um, like if, if I spun it that way, I could get on any stage in the country probably. And yes. You know. Yes. But it, but it's just like but like those things. It's just like it's as someone who like for a while like that was the path I was headed on. Like, it, it's just so disingenuous because like they they give you. Like, so I was in reparative therapy for years. I, I got the language down and I knew how to tell a story about God's redemption so yeah. easily. But it's like these cookie cutter lines, like it's like what what people are made to believe about sexuality. But it's always just like, especially when it comes to sexuality and gender, um, it's like, we believe that we're supposed to love our neighbors. Yes, that's a good thing. We believe that violence against the LGBTQ community is wrong. Yes. Awesome. We believe that uh, marriage is between a man and a woman, though. Sorry. Um, and it, right. it's, it's one of these things where it's just, it's so inconsistent to me to, to say that just like, you know, we want to love everybody, but just like, we cannot affirm, uh, like we, like, I don't understand how people can say I can love my neighbor, but not who they are, or how they love. Um, cause yeah. to them in their minds, like our sexuality is still this thing that is like disembodied from ourselves. And what's very interesting on those, like, is so many of, uh, especially like, um, more Calvinist or even just any from anything from the evangelical stream is like raging. It's like Gnosticism. We have to get rid of Gnosticism. And I'm just like <laughs> to view sexuality as something that is separate from, from you outside of your body as a spiritual issue is Gnosticism. If anything, by living into my sexuality, by living into my gender identity, I am embodying who I am created to be. I am embodying my spirituality. I am embodying And it impacts the way you relate to everybody. Yes. The church should be the first place to acknowledge that because they spend so much time crafting rules around the behavior between the way men and women interact. Like, they should understand how gender and sexuality impacts relationship. I mean, admittedly, those rules tend to be very toxic and birth out of fear that, that create problems. But mm. 
the mere fact that it exists in the first place lends credence to that being a real construct that we care about. Mm-hmm. Mm. Dang. Goodness. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I wish I had like I wish I had like just um, a glass of uh, makers right here so I could like <laughs> next time you'd I'm clink, in New York. You'd clink it, yes, please. You'd clink it with my new Belgium watermelon ale. It doesn't taste like watermelon at all. But hey, no shit. It is alcohol. So, amen. Sometimes, <laughs> let me tell you what. There are just days when I'm when I get home from whatever I'm doing and I'm just like, good God, give me a sour beer, please. <laughs> give me some like i don't want anything hard i just need something a little sweet mm-hmm. um and something that's gonna like take the edge off because lord knows there are days um i um slight pivot and mm-hmm. i'm not even really sure um there's no way to gracefully pivot on this but i did <laughs> want to i, I did want to ask about um well first of all like um are you you're super open about being a queer human correct yeah okay yeah Cool. I, I mean, thought, it's in my Twitter profile. At this okay, point, so, yeah. I figured as much. Um, so being um like a queer POC in kind of like the video game world, that's which seems to be very male and white dominated. Um, uh, what's uh, what's been your experience as a queer POC in that world? Um, has it been tough? Has it been inspiring to see other people living into their truth? Um, I'm just curious to know because like I I'm not I've never been to a convention of that of sort things like that mm. but it's just my perception yeah. from the outside yeah no yeah that's a, that's a good question um for me it's been i think really now more than ever it has been a more unique experience i wouldn't go as far to say that it's been alienating i don't feel that way i feel like um and you know i think for some i think for especially with Gamergate and other things that have happened in the past couple of years. Um, sorry, what is what is for, Gamergate? Uh, Gamergate is this. So sorry, I, I only I only assumed you might know because it was like probably the only like gaming community thing that surfaced to like Colbert Report and like mainstream kind of service. But it, it happened a couple of years ago, and it was a bit of like an anti-feminist uh, precursor to like the alt right kind of sharing their voice on. Oh on okay. how they feel about diversity in the community. Um, but it was disguised as, um, um, it was disguised as raising ethics in games journalism. Like that was sort of like, interesting. The, yeah. The guise of it was, we just want to like really help out ethics in games journalism. And part of that means pushing back on, Articles that now start to talk about because as as video games are sort of more like as far as populist opinion goes are being recognized as like a legitimate art form. Part of what comes with that are people introducing different voices and talking about holding it accountable to the same standards that we do with film where we are talking about representation. We are talking about um, our uh, how we're representing people and how we're building worlds because building worlds um in a lot of ways can push forward a particular worldview. For example, how we think about indigenous people, all these other things right. when we don't even know it, you know what I mean? Like right, the right, kind right. of things you're not conscious of. So anyway, um, with all of that being said for some parts of the community, I'm being generous with what I'll say. But what I will say is that largely, or at least in my experience, the gaming community has always kind of been a place for uh, people who feel a little bit like on the outside of things, at least socially, right? Yeah. Like they might be, there might still be, there's definitely an over, I mean, there's a lot of like straight white men in that space, but straight white men who nonetheless don't feel like they fit into a sort of a normative understanding of what like acceptable is, right? Mm-hmm. And I think in that it creates this kind of general bank of empathy that has made my experience feel incredibly comfortable since I was a kid. Um, what I I'll I'll lead in with a caveat and and with that I'll say um, because I've been asked this question before uh, especially within the world of YouTube and stuff and yeah. making internet content um, everyone in my life has been incredibly supportive and uh, people have people have elevated my voice and raised me up and talk about how they feel about having different voices and I've experienced predominantly uh, positivity. Um, I will say that I'll add a caveat in there that I don't feel like should subtract from what I just said, 
that um, I'm from a mixed family and I grew up uh, and I'm mixed myself and, you know, I grew up looking up to like white faces as people who care about me and love mm-hmm. me. And so for me, code switching isn't emotionally expensive for me. Hmm. Um, it's fairly fine. So if you're like a blue dog, like kind of like, well, I'm not going to go down the whole route, <laughs> but like, <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there. But like, <laughs> um, it, it's so it's, it's, it's generally not an expensive thing for me to do that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like I can easily kind of maneuver amongst different cultures. Fine. So, like with that, I think that I think I think that maybe there are other people out there who have a, a different experience. Yeah. I don't really know. Um, I don't want to let that be a leeway to erase my experience, but I'm just saying. So, of course. Uh, <laughs> I um. I uh, that that has has largely been good. I will say lately, as far as like you know being being out, um, being out and being queer, um, I did come to terms with learning. Um, my own limits. Uh, so with conventions, for example, it's funny. So I have a, I have a friend named Pete Ellison. He, um, we became really good friends a couple years ago at a, uh, at a, a Portland retro gaming expo. And I really loved his work. He's, he's this amazing illustrator. He does amazing work and he's really like passionate about what he does. We started sending emails back and forth, uh, just cause I was like, Oh man, I really admire stuff, whatever we're talking. And this was all sort of during while I was sort of like slowly coming out to friends and just being like, all right, right. well, you know, this is a thing that happened. And, uh, it turned out he's, 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 he's a gay man as well. And we started talking and connecting over that. And it was through, he's, he's, he's an older guy. Like he's, He's older than me. He has a few years on me. Um, so as sort of like like an older guy in the same community that I am, doing mm-hmm. the same convention tours that I am, yeah. uh, he kind of became a bit of a mentor. And immediately he started pointing out things that I never noticed about myself. Like he would say things like, hey, I bet when you go to conventions, like maybe like day two, day three, you start getting really tired. Like you start getting real tired real fast. Um, and I was like, I do. What do you, what do you mean? Like, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. and he's like, he's like, it's because you are in a space that is oversaturated with straight white dudes. And like, <laughs> it's true. And, and it's, and it wears on you. It wears. And it's so every convention, every convention, my friends who I'm hanging out with, I'm staying in their room. We're sharing rooms together. Like they're always like, are you okay? Are you all right? And in my head, I'm like, I'm so like I'm to, like this is great. I'm around people that I love. I've been talking to you guys on the internet all year. We're all here in the same place. This is great. There's all this really cool stuff to check out on the exposition floor, but I'm so exhausted and like yeah. I I like most of these conversations, I don't want to participate in them. I don't understand why half of them are happening. I don't want to talk about like how many subscribers or whatever. I don't want to talk about analytics. I don't want to like there are all these different contexts I don't, contests that I don't want to be a part of. There's all these different things that like my mind's just not there because I'm not I'm not wired that way or like whatever. And and he was like and he just explained to me why. So, and I realized right away like that's it's totally true. Like mm-hmm. you just get exhausted. Have you experienced that in any in maybe like a different way? Like yeah. I, I just I thought it was the craziest thing. Yeah, but. it's totally true, and I I've been there because uh, uh, similarly, I mean, I do I go to a lot of like uh, I mean, a lot by that I mean that there's like two I go to the two largest Christian <laughs> queer Christian conferences, uh, and I have been going for the past two years since I've been out. Um, but um, I've also, um, I for example, like if I am ever maybe not to the same level, but like if I, I've never been to a large Christian conference that wasn't queer friendly, um, or didn't have a large queer population present there. That's um, awesome. Uh, yeah. So on the one hand, super lucky. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I have been to, um, straight Christian parties and mm. I've, I've experienced a similar thing. So like being like maybe one of maybe two people in the room, who are queer or at least openly queer. And um, like, I, I can think back to a couple years ago, I went to a Halloween party where me and my best friend Casey uh, decided to do like some sugar skull masks on and looked like ooky spooky and super fun. Um, but like the moment I got there, i kind of felt like, you know, I don't really want to be here. <laughs> like I'm looking yeah. at all these people who are nice, but 
you know, like we don't like the way we operate. It's al- it's almost like an energy thing. It's like, um, the w- it's it's like I you know we have to spend energy to exist in the world, right? Um, and when yeah. I I find when I am surrounded by my queer community, like we get to share the burden of spending that energy, um, mm. or or maybe yeah. we even get to like pour into each other, so it feels like more life giving. Yeah, and so perhaps it's when you're when we are going into spaces that are different than our own, um, whether or not we know it, there is a large emotional tax on it because it's not that people are being um, hurtful, spiteful, rude, um, or unkind. It's that they just don't see you, not the full you. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Yes. Oh my gosh, I've never heard it articulated that way. Yes. Yeah, I'm with you. And I'm with so you. it's um it's a it's a matter of just like. I'm I'm uh, I'm not seen, and so I'm having to put on this extra energy just to like be here. Because like when you're seen, when you're really seen, that's an act of being poured into. When you're acknowledged, it is a way to, uh, to just like to like to stand your holy ground in a certain way. That's why like yeah. going to this church this past two years, like every single week, every single week I've been there, like I leave. Like you shouldn't leave. Here's a rule, everybody listening to this: you shouldn't go to a church <laughs> and leave more tired than when you came in. Real. Yeah, if if a church is like emotionally and spiritually taxing on you, that's a sign. Don't go yeah. there no more. <laughs> I um, agree. Yeah, and so I think that's um, that is that might be it. It's just that like perhaps in those spaces at those conventions that are dominated by white straight cis dudes, that it's um uh, it's not that they um hate you because you're a queer person. They're not. They if you said like, oh that's nice, you're cool, great. Um, yeah. but it's like, it goes beyond that. Like to have someone who like really sees you yeah, really knows you and also shares that, that common experience of, uh, being a queer person existing in the world in whatever, uh, pattern or axes that exists on. Yeah. That's big. That's so, so big D- dude. Totally to write off of your, your church comment. Like I, I remember when I started kind of getting back into things I went to and I had this whole thing. It took me a while to like really shake myself free. I had this whole like, well, I should really be challenging my worldview. If I feel the opposite way, I should like challenge it. So like, oh, my gosh, I got the same way. (laughs) You do the same thing. So I was like, yeah, I was like, okay, I'm just going to throw myself into this reformed Southern Baptist church here. And like, (laughs) you just a glutton for self punishment. It was a nightmare, girl. It was a nightmare. All right. (laughs) And like, I just. It nothing was, and it was. Just, it just got to the point. I was just saying whatever I wanted at small group. Like it, that it didn't. Wild. Yeah. So anyway, I found like I remember. I I, I found like I, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Middle Collegiate with Jackie Lewis uh, um, in New York. Yes. 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 I yeah, I am village. a big fan of their work. Oh, it was so rejuvenating. Like, I think I got pulled in like when she was like, yeah, so, you know, I was like, because she has she's the cutest like little voice. She's like, yeah, so I was I spent a week on a mountain with Richard Rohr and I was just and I was like, oh, OK. Like, like bitch, what? Good morning. Yes. <laughs> we do that. OK. <laughs> like, yeah. And I definitely I, it was like a 180. Like, I definitely I leave rejuvenated for the week mm. and I don't I don't have the words for it and I'm not really interested in having the words for it, but. Mm-hmm. It's great. You know? It's just it's it's a matter of knowing like, you know, churches can be welcoming all day. But then there's an act of uh, well, welcoming is, you know, when you feel it. And it's not for a person who's in a position of of majority or power to say what is welcome. Um, it is when you like when when the outsider comes in, do they feel exactly what you're talking about that they feel rejuvenated in a way that they don't really have words for but they just know that this space is okay yeah and this space is good i have been i've been going to a different church recently that i've been uh as a way of like forming my exit strategy for my present church Mm, Um, yeah but uh it's exactly what you're talking about um when uh uh the pastor got up there and uh one is a black gay man as a pastor gets up there to preach and then he prays in the name of jesus the black messiah and i said <laughs> yes god <laughs> oh and i'm just like i am here for it yeah. um but yeah. it, it's 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 uh but it's that thing where just like yeah it's perfectly ordinary and 
yet so rare. I agree. I mm-hmm. like I I it, it wasn't until I was like in that context where I was like I need the voice I need the voice of like a black woman to speak to me about these these mm-hmm. things cuz I've heard like I think my whole thing like sometimes it's like if there's a talk or whatever that's going on I'm just like I've he- I've I know your ne- I've heard your perspective I've heard it forever it's mm-hmm. everywhere I I know it like Yes. I'm good like I'm ready I'm ready for the small voices you know. Yeah. I think I was actually just doing, um, I do a Devo, like a, a devotional for my Patreon supporters who support at $7 a month. So if you're listening and you want to be a part of that, go to patreon.com slash the Kevin Garcia. Um, um, thank you so much for encouraging and endorsing that. Um, but I was reading in, uh, it's an Old Testament passage and it was talking about uh, Deborah, the judge of Israel was sitting up on her mountain and it was after 20 years of being oppressed that that the the leaders went to her and said, what do we need to do? Um, and I'm just like, it is so interesting. Like, you know, it's, it's only after 20 years of oppression, only after like all like conventional mm. wisdom has been destroyed. And we says that when we finally realize that nothing works, then we turn to the voices on the margins oh, for wisdom. Gosh. Oh and Deborah, gosh. as a woman at this time, <laughs> who occupied uh, a, a judge's space, which is a ruling position in Israel, uh, who was a prophetess, who uh, was also quite described, apparently by historical accounts, as being strong-bodied and strong-willed. Um, yeah. You know, even though, and, and she was still married, she was still married to a man, but still subverted that gender role. Like, it's only after a time, like, we've been getting our ass kicked for so long, I guess we'll go talk to the girl. And then <laughs> guess what she did? She's like, I'm going to draw them out and I'm, and then the Lord will deliver them into your hand. And it's like, and then on top of that, like at the end of that battle, um, she said, and they're like, will you come with us? And she's like, if I do, the Lord will deliver the victory into the hands of a woman. Do you know how that story ends? It's one of my favorites. Are you still there? No, please. Oh, okay, this is where the story ends. Please, with the re- reveal. Give me the reveal. So the, the, the Israelites go into battle. Deborah is there, like, just like watching it because it's, you know, what she does. And the leader of the, of the enemy's army escapes and uh, goes and hides with his friend in, in his, in his like, guest tent or whatever. So they may have defeated the army, but they still didn't get the leader, which means that the, you know, their enemies are still can fight back. Right. And so... Um, in the middle of the night, uh, so enemy king is in his friend's tent. His the friend's wife sneaks into the enemy king's guest tent in the middle of the night and dra- drives a tent peg through his temple uh, and kills him, uh, which is gruesome and weird. <laughs> and like it's one of those very interesting stories from the Bible that I haven't really quite squared with the God of love and mercy sort of deal. Sure, sure. But it's very interesting to me, just like. It's like driving the sword into the guts, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this whole it, yeah. Judges, yeah. It's it's uh oh, was that with with Jehoshaphat? Yeah, and it, the the sword swallowed up in his guts. Yeah, yeah, oh! yeah. <laughs> it was so graphic. I was yeah, like, all right, all right. <laughs> um, but then like I, I I always look at things like allegorically. I'm just like. That wasn't just you know his 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 body swallowing up. That was his excess, and that was his uh mm. his uh his his appetite and lust for um for destruction that swallowed it like it swallowed itself up yes <laughs> and he was he was he was destroyed by his own violence but you know we could go into allegory all day uh but it's just very I'm interesting there. to me that like <laughs> and it also just gives me so much hope that there are places in this world both here in the south and up in the big city of new york where like those voices from the margins are finally like getting a place to to say something yeah um because I think that um, if if the church is to survive, um, like talking big C church, like um, yeah. not you know, the industry it, around it. Yes, that was the big thing. Like you said at the very beginning of this podcast, just to bring it full circle, that just like really touched me is that like so much of church life, especially in the past, uh, I guess like since we were kids in our in the past twenty years, has been about creating a product and a brand and an identity that you can uh, market and sell and this is what's going to bring in the numbers and this is what it's going to bring the people with the dollar signs to our door and get their butts in the seat. You know, it's a 50 do- it's a 50 minute rock concert with a little bit of an inspirational message. That's really good for everyone but doesn't have a really great substance to it that's challenging us in any ways. 
Yeah. Um, but we're going to build an industry around it, and a few select people are going to make money off of it. And that's not... I, I struggle with uh, calling anybody a pastor who doesn't know their flock. You know? Yeah, I agree. And I think we're entering an age... Um, I mean, I think it was Phyllis Tickle who pointed out in one of her books that like every 500 years has been a great reformation and we just hit reformation 500. So did we really, Oh yeah. Since Martin Luther hit like since Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses to the door, uh, on, uh, on all saints That's day. Why I love, I love it. Actually I was able, it was, it was through an interaction we had on Twitter that I was able to grab lunch with uh, Matthew vines while he was in the city. Oh, dope. He came. Yes, and what a wonderful human! Yeah. Well, first, what a wonderful human. Second, we went. Yeah, we um. He, he came to see Dear Evan Hansen. Listen, listen, <laughs> listen to what she did. Listen to what she did. What did Matthew do? She she got tickets to see Dear Evan Hansen, but the the headliner Chris Platt, which I totally understand by the way, mm-hmm. he was sick, and he get to sing. They had a backup. He reported to me that Chris Platt that the Chris Platt replacement was not as good. <laughs> She got another. She got another set of tickets when yes. Chris Platt was on before she left. I was like, "Yes, he's go like, in." He's like, ah, "Listen, I will not be kept from what is mine." That is that's right. <laughs> like, and it was funny. Is like Matthew texted me like, um, like cause I think he saw us like interacting on Twitter, and he was like, "How do you know Satchel?" I'm just like, technically speaking, just through the internet, but yeah. we're kindred spirits, so it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I love that he calls what he's doing a Reformation project. I love that he has – he's sort of reclaims what Reformation means, like mm-hmm. being a sort of former Reformationary, someone from the Reformed camp. Like we would constantly say we're reforming, but it's like, well, we keep looking – at, we keep like fetishizing this Dutch Germanic theology. We're really just reiterating. Like mm-hmm. we're not – like the the Westminster Seminary like slogan was always like always reforming. I was like that's always reiterating. Like we're not really yeah. – and I kind of feel like – reiterata. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's exactly what it is. Um, it, I, I love that like he's, he's – like Matt is bringing the pain and that he's mm-hmm. reclaiming what reforming truly means. Yeah. He is a, a good soul and one of – um, you know, like when I, f- when I first met him, like I was like a little bit like romanticized with like, I was like, oh my gosh, Matthew Vines, he wrote God and the Gay Christian. This book saved my life. Blah, blah, blah. And then like yeah. the, when I finally got to know him, I'm just like, oh, you're kind of a weirdo just like me. This is great. <laughs> yes. Um, but like, just like the most, it's just like, he just knows who he is. And yeah. I, um, and he doesn't, um, back down from that. And I think like if any, if any example of what it is to live fearlessly authentic, um, I think he's got a good handle on it and it makes me, I'm joyful that I get to work with him. Um, and mm. I get to see him about twice a year at conferences, which is dope. That's um, cool. And listen, y'all need to move some stuff to the East coast. I'm just saying, I'm just oh. talking. I see you guys having fun. I'm like, Oh, they look like that was such a good time. And it's always California. Chicago. <laughs> well, we're going to Orlando next fall, so just come down and we'll go to Disney afterward. Listen, that's real talk. Yeah, I will yeah. be there. <laughs> that was my conversation with Satchel Drakes. You can connect with Satchel all over the internet on Twitter at Satchel Drakes, Instagram at Satchel.Drakes, and on YouTube dot com slash satchbags goods and follow him and listen to him on the forbes overworld podcast which you can find wherever you listen to your podcasts thanks so much to everyone out there who supports this work as a sustaining partner on patreon it has been amazing to see the amount of people who have joined this month we've got eight new people a growth of over 135 dollars in support this month which is like freaking nuts to me um, so honestly, the question for you, if this podcast has been good for you, if it's been life-giving, if you think this podcast is worth even a dollar a month, I would really encourage you to become a sustaining partner. Um, because, uh, we're all trying to do this together, right? And creating content that reflects the queer and progressive Christian experience 
is more important than ever in my opinion we need to hear better stories we need to hear deeper stories we need to hear diverse stories and not just diversity in the way that your company is trying to be diverse but actually deeply rooted committed to radical difference with one another and that's what i'm trying to do here is to try to tell different stories of people different from myself um so if you've got a couple extra bucks uh in your bank account if you've got a couple extra bucks that you can spare per month I would really appreciate it if you could support the work because uh, the money you give helps offset the cost of creating. It offsets the cost of uh, graphic design. It offsets the cost of hosting things. It offsets the cost of uh, my, my MailChimp service, the whole nine yards. And also offsets the time I have to spend in a restaurant working so that I can do things like this. Um, honestly, if it was not for my supporters on Patreon, I'd be working closer to 60 hours a week rather than the 40 hours a week I do now. So yeah, if this is good for you, if you think it's important, go to patreon.com slash the Kevin Garcia and check out all the dope perks you can get for becoming a sustaining partner. There's everything from newsletters to free shirts to daily devotionals, uh, sent straight to your inbox. What more could you want? I don't really know, but again, go to patreon.com slash the kevin garcia learn how you can become a supporting partner and let's make more amazing things together another way you can support this podcast is by leaving a rating in itunes it's super simple just go to your itunes podcast app click five stars say oh my gosh kevin's like really smart and like he has really cool people on and they're so revolutionary Leaving a rating on iTunes honestly does help because it connects other people with this podcast so they can uh, learn about it. So just uh, go there. Do that. Thank you so much. And if you'd like, you can connect with me on social medias on my blog, thekevingarcia.com, on my YouTube channel where I make videos about being queer and Christian. Big surprise, I know. There's dope stuff happening all over the place and I want you to be able to connect with me. So uh, be sure to say hello. And if you want to leave a comment or a suggestion for the show, you can do that on the website at thekevingarcia.com. I'm always up for hearing feedback from you, from questions, or people you want to see on the podcast, or hear on the podcast, as it were. Anyways, that's all for me. Go see your therapist, do some yoga, drink some coffee, hug somebody if you like physical touch. Uh, remember to eat something, and which is what I'm about to do because I haven't eaten since breakfast, and there's some leftover turkey and stuffing in the fridge. Yes, God. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Kevin Garcia. This is The Tiny Revolution. I love you so much. Don't forget that, okay, hon? And uh, I'll talk to you real soon. Bye now. Mwah!